Frankie Corrado is back with us uh, once again. We're having it's coaching questions. Basically, we're having Frankie uh, become the head coach of all the seven Canadian NHL teams, and we're asking Frankie what's the biggest question for each of these coaches about their respective teams. And we already uh, got through the Western teams earlier in the show, so let's do the Eastern Canadian teams. Let's start with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, Craig Berube and the Leafs, the core four looks like it's returning. They've added on the back end. You've got Anthony Stolarz to pair with Joseph Wall and Nett. Uh, what is Craig Berube thinking, Frankie Corrado, as he gets set to take over this team? He would probably be thinking, Jay, how do I get this team to play differently come playoff time than how they've played in the past? Like, those players, the core four, they've done really well in the regular season. They've shattered records team records, league records, personal records. It's all been done. When it comes to the playoff times, things just look a little bit different. The big question is going to be, how does Craig Berube find a way to get more out of these guys in the playoffs? And that's rebound goals. That's not letting the, the momentum kind of sway you in a game, in a series. Like, all these things that you're going to kind of lean on, someone like Craig Berube and what he's done, and he's won a Stanley Cup as a coach – like, how does he get his players to implement that come playoff time? That's going to be the biggest question for the Maple Leafs and Craig Berube. The other Ontario team in Ottawa, you bring in Linus Allmark to solidify things in net. And their new head coach is Travis Green. Uh, they've missed the playoffs seven straight years, Frankie. What is uh, Green's biggest question as he gets set to take over behind the Sens bench? Is there enough? of a veteran presence around this young group. And, and that's something that's been lacking in Ottawa for a little while now. And they've taken some swings at some veteran guys, and there's been some misses. The one that hit was Claude Giroux. Now, there was, there was too much for Claude Giroux to have to take care of as a veteran guy. Um, and now they've added uh, David Perron. So, you know, there's, there's two guys that are very highly regarded around the league that should be able to help insulate the young core forward group in Ottawa um, so, so that'll be a question for them as far as how do you mesh the two? How do you mesh the, the young guys, the Stutzlas, the Norris, if he's healthy, uh, Shane Pinto, Brady Kachuk, with the Claude Giroux and, and David Perron? And is there enough of that to kind of ease the burden on those young guys who, you know, have been paid? There's a lot of responsibility on their shoulders. Uh, but it's, you know, if we've watched them play over the last couple of years, they do need a little help as they try and inch things along in Ottawa. You touched on it, Frankie. You bring in Perron, you bring in Allmark, Jake Chikrin leaves. In your mind, looking at the roster as it is right now, are they clearly a better team than they were last season in your eyes? They should be, uh, but they're still not, like, they're not a playoff team. Or, you know, they, they should be in the vicinity of maybe trying to be, I don't know, they're trying to try to be a playoff team, if that, if that makes yep. sense, Jay. Like, they're yep. two spots from being two spots away from being a playoff team when it comes to the Eastern Conference, and that's a reasonable expectation for this group. You know, this is not an offseason where they went out and tried to make the big splash. Everything that they did had a purpose, made sense, and now we're going to see if everything can kind of work together here with a new head coach who's going to preach accountability, defensive structure, a goalie that has won a Vesna that you think you can believe in, um, and, and, you know, a little more of a veteran presence around this group. So it wasn't exactly super flashy, but it didn't have to be. It just had to be purposeful, and it was. Now we wait and see if they can execute on the ice. It was a, I think for some people in Montreal, Frankie, it was a surprisingly quiet offseason for the Montreal Canadiens, though they do get your eye Slavkovsky to sign on a long-term deal, and that's terrific news. But for the Montreal Canadiens and Martin St. Louis, what is the biggest question that St. Louis will face as we head into next season? If you're Marty St. Louis, you have to be asking, am I going to get Kirby Doc this year? Do mm. I finally really get to sink my teeth into what Kirby Doc can be as a player? Like, is he going to be that second-line center behind Nick Suzuki, who had such a great season, Jay, and really established himself as a true number one center in the NHL? And it hasn't exactly been easy going for Kirby Doc. When he played for Chicago, he had a season that was cut short to 18 games with a wrist injury. Uh, he comes over to Montreal his first year. He only plays 58 games because he has a, you know, a few injuries that year. And, of course, last year, the main one limits him to two games as he has ACL surgery. So there hasn't been a lot of runway for Marty St. Louis to work with Kirby Doc. And that is one of the things that Montreal has going for them is the fact that 
Marty has seemingly found a way to progress players like Caulfield, like Suzuki, like Slavkovsky, like the young defenseman on the back end. If Kirby Doc can stay healthy, we don't like we don't really know what he can be yet playing for Marty St. Louis. So that's the biggest question I'd be asking. You know, can I have Kirby Doc healthy for a full season, and what does that look like for my group? What about the defense? Uh, as a former defenseman yourself, they have so many young defensemen. You know, David Savard, notwithstanding, they've got so many young defensemen in this group. Is this defense, in your opinion? able to allow this Montreal Canadiens team to potentially compete this year, or are we still one or two years away, Marty, and is this still very much in a rebuild mode? It, it still is rebuild mode because I, I would say that the roster, it hasn't been deconstructed yet. Like, there's, there's still some money on the books and some contracts that have kind of lingered on that were probably a little too long to begin with. So until you move on from that, it still is rebuild mode, but that doesn't mean that the back end can't progress. And, you know, I, I, I give these guys a lot of credit because two years ago when they had five rookies in the lineup playing at any given night, those kids did an unbelievable job. And last year, a lot of them took steps in the right direction. And then towards the end of the season, we got to see Logan Mayu, who's a first round pick. We got to see Lane Hudson. So, you know, this, this young defense core, Jay, that had been so promising, actually added two more pieces towards the end of the year to that promising group. So um, it, it was already crowded with young players. Uh, it's seemingly going to be even more crowded, but those are pretty good problems to have when you're a team that's trying to get back to where they want to be. Um, but I would say they're, they're kind of right where they should be right now. Now's not the time for Montreal to make a big splash. Now is the time for them to improve internally um, and remain competitive on a night-to-night -night basis, but that doesn't mean the playoffs just quite yet. Fair enough, and we'll see if Ken Hughes decides to make Caden Gooley the next uh, long-term contract for the Montreal Canadiens. Frankie, we have been rolling out over the past few weeks uh, the best of our very popular bloop bloop segment, and as I get set for my summer vacation, uh, we've got well, one more to show you here, but on Wednesday's edition, on yesterday's edition of the show, uh, we had what many of us feel was the funniest moment in our show this entire year. And you were actually involved in that moment, Frankie. I want you to have a look, and I want everyone to have a look. Power play still. Sorry, guys. Oh, no problem. <laughs> that just threw me off. No, completely. no, that's okay. <laughs> we'll I'm so sorry. I just, no, I was okay. like, I, can't, I don't know what's going on no, here. No, no. So, just for a bit of context. Brian Hayes, Frankie, sitting alongside me. Uh, I believe we had the wrong mugs. We didn't have our Harvey's mugs. We, we tried to switch out the mugs on the fly. Brian, not used to television, just sort of froze up. And it was, but what we loved the most, Frankie, was your reaction to it. Uh, I could watch it over and over again for the rest of my life. What was going through your mind at that moment, Frankie? I don't know why I found that so funny, Jay, but like <laughs> I saw it happening from a mile away. I can't remember who on the staff was bringing the mug, but like I saw the look on the person's face like, <laughs> oh, no, we have the wrong mugs to let's try and sneak this in. We'll go stealth mode. And then as it's happening, Hayes is like, what are we doing here? <laughs> and I don't know. I just I kind of. I, I lost it. I just, I had to laugh. And I think the, the Hayes reaction is what got me. Yeah. Uh, Brian is such an easygoing, fun guy. And I just, I love that he just refused to continue. He wanted an explanation for what was going on. Uh, it just makes this show so much fun to do. Frankie, you've been such a pleasure to have on all season. Thanks so much for joining us and looking forward to catching up with you uh, in September. Okay, buddy? Buddy, thank you so much. Enjoy your summer break, and I can't wait to get back into the studio with you. It's going to be fun.